So Formula One has got a new logo, and I think it's fair to say that the fans are, uh, are liking it a lot, aren't they? Um, or oh, not? No, maybe not. Well, I give up. <laughs> What's up guys and welcome to another video and today I'm going to be talking about more pressing issues in Formula 1 that we've got than this new logo. Of course, yesterday or two days ago as you're watching this, uh, Liberty Media uh, at the end of the Grand Prix announced what the new Formula 1 logo is going to look like for 2018. And uh, yeah, it's quite a bit different but uh, obviously I think a lot of us had a lot of emotional attachment. Uh, to the old F1 logo and uh, saying goodbye to that after 24 years to a logo which is a little bit more bland I think it's fair to say um, a little bit more corporate and um, yeah I don't think a lot of people were sort of big fans of that but uh, the reason I'm here today is to talk about the more pressing issues that we've got in Formula 1 at the moment. Of course, we're coming off the back of an Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, which was an absolute snooze fest. And if it hadn't have been for Daniel Ricciardo uh, retiring from the race, I think like the top eight positions literally wouldn't have changed at all for the entire Grand Prix, which is, uh, yeah, pretty depressing. Uh, to say the least. I mean, when you're like 20 laps into the Grand Prix, uh, I don't think it was even that, it might have even been like 10 or 15, and they were following the battle for like 15th and 16th place. Uh, so yeah, when that happens, you know there's a lot to change in the sport. I took a quick look at the stats, and uh, yesterday's Grand Prix, uh, or Sunday's Grand Prix I should say, had 20 overtakes in it in the entirety of the Grand Prix, compared to 41 the year before. So um, I think more than anything that sort of indicates that um, we need sort of modifications to the track itself because that Abu Dhabi track, it's just never really been a big one for, for overtaking. Obviously, you know, my mind casts back all the way to 2010 uh, when obviously Fernando Alonso couldn't make his way past a significantly slower Renault car uh, in order to win the world championship. And I really, I think the big problem with Abu Dhabi um, is that sort of the track doesn't really get going. Obviously, you've got long straights. Um, but the problem is, like, the chicanes that they have, um, like, obviously at the end of the first DRS straight, there's a, a little chicane, and the, the problem is, the, the car doesn't really sort of, uh, it sort of loses a lot of downforce in that corner, um, and then sort of by the time that they get on the throttle, they can't really close in on the car ahead, even if it is sort of significantly slower. So yeah, I think that one is a lot down to the track, but by the same token, you can say, you know, if you look at the F2 race, uh, on Saturday, I think it was. Um, obviously, it was Albon and Charles Leclerc came down to the final lap of the race. And what a battle they had um, at the end of the... Sorry, it's like through the second sector. That was mad. And yeah, I know F2 is obviously a spec series. All the cars are the same, pretty much, um, apart from the setups. But uh, yeah, you've got to say, is it maybe down to the track? Or is it just that the these Formula 1 cars need overhauling quite a lot? Now, personally, I'd say it's, I'd say it's a little bit of a combination of the two. Um, I mean, if you look at that first sector at Abu Dhabi, you know, when it comes to an end, they've got the uh, the little chicane before the um, before the hairpin that takes you onto the main straight. Personally, I'd just completely get rid of that chicane because, yeah, I know the cars are, would be coming in quite quickly to that hairpin. Um, but just think of the overtaking opportunities that you'd have at that hairpin. It just obviously allow for an extra overtaking opportunity. Um, that would be leading onto a big straight. So it'd allow, obviously, the drivers to come back at them. And yeah, I just think generally it just provide a little bit better racing. The only thing that springs to mind um, is that the, there's sort of like a lack of runoff area. Um, if you look behind that hairpin, it's pretty much grandstand straight away. But you think, you know, when you're designing a track in Abu Dhabi, you know, it's 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 in the middle of the desert. They, they had so much room to build that track and they've built one of the worst racetracks on the calendar. So yeah, I think that one is down to Tilka. Um, and just generally just bad management to that track. They could have done, they literally could have done anything with that track. They could have made the greatest F1 track in the world. There is so much space to deal with. Money is no object. And somehow they've just created one of the worst racetracks on the entire calendar. But anyway, that is enough of me ranting about Abu Dhabi. Um, obviously the main topic that I was getting onto was just overtaking in general. So uh, if you compare the figures from um, sort of like back to the 1980s through to the present day, um, obviously, you'll notice a big, big spike in overtakes when you get to 2011. Um, of course, that was when DRS was introduced. So, yeah, nowadays it's being obviously artificially inflated by um, by the DRS overtakes. But have, have races really become that much better since 2011? I mean, obviously, we've had had like a lot of very good races, you know, like Baku this year springs to mind. 
Um, and then obviously back in 2014, we had a couple of good races, Bahrain. Um, and then, you know, 2013, 2012, we had a lot of good races. But, you know, really, like in general, if you look at like 2015, 2016, like there's not really any races that spring to mind um, like straight away. So is DRS really giving us that much better racing? I mean, personally, I much prefer the overtakes that um, sort of drivers have to really sort of plot their way around the tracks and, and really think hard about. Uh, one that springs to mind straight away is um, Vettel against Ricardo at China this year. Um, so, yeah, they were sort of coming towards the end of the first sector. Not a DRS zone whatsoever. And Vettel just completely hangs it around the outside. Such a satisfying overtake to see. And if we could see something like that, like maybe four or five times a race... That, that would be incredible, you know, like each race to see that um, around, you know, different parts of the racetrack, parts of the racetrack which we wouldn't necessarily associate with overtaking nowadays because, of course, like the drivers are thinking, right, I'm just going to stay behind and then I'll try and go for an overtake on the DRS straight. And is that really very exciting? I wouldn't say so. So I wouldn't say DRS in itself is the issue, but I think we need to sort of encourage more overtaking opportunities around the track. Before I get on to ideas to maybe like encourage overtaking or increase overtaking, I'm just going to give you a quick stat. So this year at the uh, Azerbaijan Grand Prix in Baku, there were 137 overtakes and that is only 49 fewer than the entire 1996 season. So yeah, believe it or not, there was only 186 overtakes in the entire season. And if you look at some Grand Prix back in 2011, I'll try and get the stat up now. Uh, it was one Grand Prix had, yeah, the Chinese Grand Prix last year in 2016 had 161 overtakes. So yeah, that's 25 fewer than in one entire season. Um, but would you say that Grand Prix was worth an entire season's worth of action? Probably not. I mean, not for one minute am I saying to sort of bring back the pre-2011 era, um, because I think there were bigger problems um, sort of at heart there. Um, it's not just a case of literally get rid of DRS and everything will be fine. Um, it's a case of sort of modifying the cars in order to actually over, uh, you know, encourage better overtaking. For example, if we look at that pre-DRS era, uh, the 2009 European Grand Prix actually had zero overtakes in the entire race. Uh, that was also the case uh, in 2003 at Monaco and uh, 2006 San Marino, there was only one overtake and the same goes for a couple of other Grand Prix in sort of that uh, early 2000s era. So a few of the methods to maybe increase overtaking. Um, one suggestion is to reintroduce the ground effect. Now this is something which was present sort of throughout, I believe it was the 70s and 80s. It might, have been, it might even have been earlier than that. Now one theory is to reintroduce uh, what is known as the ground effect. So that was something which was present in Formula 1, I believe through the 1970s and 80s. And um, basically it makes the um, sort of like the entire car into one aerodynamic device. Um, so rather than literally just having like front wing, rear wing and, uh, and a floor, it sort of made, like I say, the entire car into one aerodynamic device. Um, but unlike a front and rear wing, they don't um, like um, the ground effect doesn't produce as much turbulence. Um, and therefore, the, the, the cars were sort of able to clo uh, follow each other a lot closer. The reason it was banned, however, is that uh, it was found to be quite unsafe um, because it was so, like such a powerful aerodynamic device. Um, it actually increased cornering speed to quite dangerous levels. And obviously, at the time, the, um, the cars really weren't uh, sort of the safest. And uh, there was actually quite a few deaths and serious injuries as a result. So, yeah, I think if this was to be reintroduced, it would sort of have to be uh, monitored and maybe even regulated by... Um, by sort of the FIA and uh, maybe having like uh, one device that was sort of like standard for the entire teams. But again, this sort of takes away from the whole aero development race. And uh, yeah, it's quite a difficult one, I guess. That is, of course, just one theory. Um, obviously, um, you know, from 2021, we're going to have the reintroduction of driver deployed curs. Uh, so yeah, they're getting rid of the MGUH and replacing it with a bigger MGUK. I believe it's that anyway. And uh, yeah, I think that will help in terms of overtaking because of course drivers will be able to store it up over the course of a few laps and then um, you know then be be able to really sort of plot an overtake. So again, that's that's another uh, possible alternative to, uh, to you know to try and see um, better overtaking. But I think in general, just the 2017 regulations, obviously going to wider front wings and the, the cars do look do, do look very nice, you know, compared to, to, to previous years. 
But the whole wide front wing, rear wing, just produces a lot of turbulence, difficult to get out of the dirty air. And as we've seen in a lot of Grand Prix this season, Abu Dhabi, Hungary, uh, Monaco, it is very, very difficult to overtake. And, uh, you know, also it's made the cars wider. Less space to overtake in doesn't really add up, does it? If any of you guys have uh, have suggestions of maybe how F1 could increase overtaking, do make sure to leave them down in the comments down below. And as always, I will try to respond to all of them. The next pressing issue in Formula 1 we're going to get onto is the halo. Now, obviously, uh, a lot of people have, uh, have mixed thoughts on the halo, mostly negative. Um, of course... The, the halo is definitely going to make the cars uglier. I mean, they're just, they're just not going to look the same. But um, obviously, we've had quite a few um, incidents in motorsport recently. Uh, Jules Bianchi, uh, his death in 2014. Now, I will say on this one, it is questionable whether the halo would have actually saved him. Um, but then you look at incidents like Justin Wilson, who I believe died in 2015 in IndyCar. Uh, Henry Surtees, son of John Surtees, um, back in sort of 2011, 2012, I believe that was. And, yeah, you look at various incidents over uh, single-seat uh, history, like recent history, and a lot of them, pr I'd, I'd imagine, could have been saved by the Halo because the FIA have put a lot of development into, uh, into this device, and they found that it is going to be safe. So, if it can save the life of a driver, you've got to say it's probably worth it. Um, the flip side to that, not saying it's my opinion, is, uh, you know, people will say that, you know, if you're going into motorsport, you've got to sort of recognise the dangers um, personally, I'm not completely sold on the Halo. I'll have to give it a few races uh, in order to see whether there are negative effects. But if there are no negative effects, and obviously it's going to save the life of a driver, you've got to say, you know, the, the pros outweigh the cons. Going into the future and, uh, you know, like into the 2020s uh, and beyond, I'd like to think that the FIA are looking into sort of different um, sort of cockpit protection mechanisms. Um, we've seen the likes of like the closed cockpits. Uh, we've all seen like the closed cockpit designs on Twitter uh, floated about, uh, like the, the you know the concept designs. Not necessarily sure whether that's going to be um, something which will be beneficial, but like the shield that Red Bull tested, uh, something like that is something that I'd, I'd like to see personally. Obviously, it wasn't seen to have been seen to have been as good as the Halo, which is why they didn't implement it. But uh, yeah, something like that that does give the drivers protection, but just looks a little bit better than the Halo. Uh, I think that would be welcomed in the future. I think it was only a matter of time there before they were really going to implement something like this. Uh, I think there was a lot of pressure from the likes of, um, you know, the obviously the FIA to, uh, you know, to do something about the, uh, to, in order to reduce head injuries. But uh, yeah, like I say, we'll have to see. And the final pressing matter that I've got to talk about is engines. Obviously, next season, we've got 21 races and we're going down to three engines per season, which is ridiculous because... You know, at the moment, we've got four engines a season, and there's just drivers taking penalties left, right, and center. Even when we had five, it was happening, so I just don't see the point in decreasing it. The other thing is, I don't think it's really decreasing cost. Um, you know, you're giving each driver one less engine, um, but, you know, the amount of development work that each company is having to do into this, uh, for example, Mercedes, I believe they supply four teams on the grid. Uh, it's thought that they run about 100 engines through the dyno each season. So, you know, is, is that really reducing cost? 100 engines. That's, that's like, you know, sticking 100 engines into a car um, for each season, which is, is just ridiculous. It's like giving each driver basically one engine per weekend almost. So I'm not completely sold on the fact that these engines this, in, in this V6 era are really the best of directions that they could have gone in. Now, I fully understand that sort of these V6 turbo hybrid engines are the future. Um, especially in terms of road cars, you know, you see a lot of hypercars nowadays, the likes of the McLaren P1, the LaFerrari, the Porsche 918, all go into uh, hybrid power. Um, so, yeah, I, I do believe that F1 has done the right thing in order to go to this hybrid power. But these V6 power units are just way too complex. And, yeah, it's just... It's, it's really not becoming accessible to sort of a wide market of engine suppliers, which is what Formula One wants to be. You know, it wants to be the pinnacle. Manufacturers like Aston Martin, Porsche, just to name a couple, they want that, you know, surely F1 wants them to come to the sport and uh, produce engines. But yeah, they're just way too complicated. And as we've seen, Honda, who came in one year too late, they just haven't been able to catch up at all. And uh, yeah, it's just becoming ridiculous now. I will be intrigued to see how the uh, 2021 regulations sort of, uh, yeah, shape up and whether it is really going to negate the advantage Mercedes have now and uh, maybe become a little bit more accessible. 
Uh, yeah, that obviously remains to be seen. They are sticking with the V6 uh, hybrid engines, of course. They're not going to V8s for the foreseeable future. Um, but yeah, like I say, we'll have to see on that. Removing the MGUH I think is good because it sort of reduces the complication. But I do still believe there is way too much stuff going on in those engines to, uh, like I say, become accessible. Before we end this video, though, I am going to get into the thoughts of you guys of what you want improving. So, um, yeah, I actually put a tweet out uh, about 20 minutes ago saying uh, about to record a video and, uh, yeah, any thoughts that you guys want me to improve. So, uh, yeah, I'll take a quick read through them now. So the first one I've got is from at undercut F1. So he talks about the possibility of F1 being streamed online rather than being on pay TV. So, uh, yeah, this is quite a bit different to what I've talked about, which is why I picked it. Um, but yeah, I have to agree, you know, at the moment, they're excluding a lot of people by having it, obviously, on pay TV. Um, not really getting a lot of viewers involved. Uh, the question is, though, would they be making more money off the people who, obviously, um, you know, buy, the, buy, buy pay TV or whatever you do to pay TV? Um, so, yeah, the amount of rights, like money from rights that they're getting from that, is that going to outweigh um, them putting it on stream only you know i don't know how much they get from advertising um and then obviously more race fans buying tickets but at the end of the day it's it's, it's a business and as much as i'd love to see it on on sort of stream rather than uh you know paying for it i'm not sure whether they're going to go for that in the near future dcg f1 just says mercedes domination i'll leave it there and yeah i think he makes a good point you know f1 would just be so much better if there wasn't one team dominating um, of the last eight seasons in F1, there's only been two Constructors champions, and they've been in blocks of four. So uh, from 2010 to 2013, we had four Red Bull championships, and now from 2014 to 2017, we've had four Mercedes championships in a row. Obviously, in the early 2000s, we had a complete domination from Ferrari from 1999 through to 2004, I believe. Um, so yeah, again, a long period of, of just domination, and then we had two years of Renault, uh, then we had sort of McLaren and, and Ferrari each season. So, yeah, I've got to agree. You know, it's um, it, any any team dominating, I don't think is good for the sport. But it's so difficult to regulate, um, you know, that sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, have to agree with it. I have read the rest of the tweets and uh, I actually read them before the start of the video as well. Uh, a lot of them, which is, you know, I've sort of like incorporated them uh, into the rest of my thoughts. So big thanks to everyone who responded to the tweets. It very much appreciated. And uh, yeah, hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, do make sure to leave a like down below and comment your thoughts as always. And uh, yeah, I will catch you guys in my next video. Do take care. Bye-bye.